You're listening to the Dibbly Dobbly Podcast. Remember to like, share, comment, subscribe, and click the bell to make sure you get the latest episodes of the podcast. Be sure to like and share our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and on Instagram. Hi everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Dibbly Dobbly Podcast. On today's episode of the podcast, we review the second ODI between Australia and New Zealand from Kalele Stadium. It's the Dibbly Dobbly Podcast and let's get started. Let's have a look at the match summary from the second ODI between Australia and New Zealand from Kalele Stadium. Australia batted first and made 9 for 195 from their 50 overs. Smith top scored with 61. Bolt took four wickets for New Zealand. New Zealand needed 196 to win. They were bowled out for 82 in 33 overs. Williamson top scored with 17. And Zampa took five wickets for Australia. Australia won by 113 runs. And Mitchell Stark was named player of the match. What were the key moments and key factors from this second ODI between Australia and New Zealand? New Zealand's bowling to get Australia 5 for 54 inside 18.3 overs. Tim Southey getting Steve Smith out for 61 as Australia were looking to get a total that they could defend and New Zealand had Australia 8 for 117 inside 36.3 overs. The partnerships between Mitchell Stark and Adam Zampa of 31 for the 9th wicket and Josh Hazelwood and Mitchell Stark of 47 unbeaten for the 10th wicket helped Australia reach 9 for 195 from their 50 overs and gave them a total that they could defend. Australia's bowling to bowl New Zealand out for 82 inside 33 overs, which saw them to victory by 113 runs. Those were the key moments and key factors from the second ODI at Kaleli Stadium. Let's have a look at both teams' performances in this second ODI at Kaleli Stadium with both bat and ball. We'll start with Australia and their batsmen, Warner 5, Finch 0, Smith 61, Labashain 5, Stornis 0, Carey 12, and Maxwell 25. That's how the Australian batsmen went about things with the bat in this second ODI against New Zealand. Now, Australia's batting in this second ODI was poor slash good. Um, it was just like game one, really. Australia were in trouble early, no surprise. Um, they were 5 down for 54 inside 18.3 overs. Once again, Trent Bolt was the main destroyer for New Zealand. Bolt a good spell up front um, and really put the pressure on Australia and their top order. Once again, Australia's top order didn't do their job again and failed for the third match in a row. We'll talk about that a bit later on. Um, Steve Smith was the only one in the top order to get through that difficult period and that spell that Trent Bolt was bowling. Um... He made 61 in the end, and it was a very good contribution from from Steve Smith, obviously. Um, looking to get Australia to that total that they could feel like they could defend. Um, in the end, they got 195, and obviously that was enough in the end because they bowled New Zealand out for 82. Um, so Smith and Maxwell combined together at the crease at one stage. They added 49 for the sixth wicket, uh, looking to get Australia to a good total. But all of a sudden, Glenn Maxwell, who batted unusual, uncharacteristic like Glenn Maxwell innings, um, but he was batting responsibly, which I liked, but all of a sudden he got out by hitting a ball straight up in the air and getting out. And Australia was 6 for 103, and that partnership was broken, and Steve Smith needed to uh, try and get Australia over the line and try to bat the 50 overs out, obviously, because Australia were in trouble of not batting the 50 overs out. Now, Australia were in deep trouble when Steve Smith got out for 61. He hit one straight up in the air and got out, just like Glenn Maxwell did. And Australia were 8 for 117 inside 36.3 overs and didn't look like batting the full 50 overs with the tail enders to come in Sampa, Stark and Hazelwood. But the partnerships of the ninth wicket and the 10th wicket between Zampa, Stark and Hazelwood all combined together and gave Australia hope now, obviously, Stark and Samper for the ninth wicket, they added 31 vital runs for Australia there. And the 10th wicket between Stark and Hazelwood added 47 unbeaten for the 10th wicket. Now, as I say, it was vital runs for Australia after the top order failed again, and the tail enders showed the top order how to bat on this surface in Cairns. Um, they added 78 runs combined uh, to get Australia from 8 for 117 to 195. So 78 crucial runs at the end 
uh, to get Australia to a total close to 200 to give them some hope of winning this match. In the end, as we know, Australia were able to bowl New Zealand out for 82 and win the match by 113 runs. So in the end, it was enough. But it was a very good partnership between Stark, uh, Zampa and Hazelwood. So Australia's batting, in the end, a bit of a mixed bag in this game. Let's talk about Smith, Sampa, Stark and Hazelwood and their contributions to Australia's batting. Not so much from other players like Warner, Finch, Labashain and Stornis and Kerry and Maxwell. And um, those uh, contributions were quite low. But Smith, Sampa, Stark and Hazelwood, their innings were quite crucial in terms of Australia getting to that 195 score. Steve Smith, the only one in the top order to really bat well and get through that tough period. A quality player is always Steve Smith. Um, Adam Zampa, he's improving with his batting. He scored 13 not out to get Australia over the line with Cameron Green in Game 1. In Game 2, um, 16 he made, 16 vital runs, and um, he's really improved his batting. His contribution was good. Mitchell Stark. Now, we know Mitchell Stark can bat. He's no mug with the bat. He's got a Test 99, and that was against India and Mahali in 2013. Um, so you can definitely bat Mitchell Stark. He averages around about 22 in Test cricket. And he got a pretty good um, score in this game, 38 not out, which is his highest score in one-day cricket in the last nine years. Um, so that's quite significant for Mitchell Stark, obviously, but we know he can be a valuable asset with both bat and ball. And Josh Hazelwood, the number 11. Uh, many people don't expect the number 11 to score many runs, but Josh Hazelwood did, 23 not out. Um, he's improved his batting over the years, Josh. Um, it was good batting from him to support Mitchell Stark at the end, and that partnership of 47 unbeaten for the 10th wicket between him and Stark were very crucial runs in terms of Australia getting to a score of nearly to 200. Um, also, Josh Hazelwood hit his first ODI 6 in the innings as well. So those four uh, players in particular, without them, Australia would have you know, rolled over and probably lost this match convincingly. But in the end, they held firm, they did their job, and, uh, you know, if Australia need to give credit to someone, they should give credit to the bowlers, of course, for their bowling performance and bowling, you know, New Zealand out for 82, but also to Steve Smith as well, who pretty much guided Australia towards the end, and then the tail enders took over. Now, we talk about Australia's top order. Once again, the top order has failed. Um, it's quite frustrating, and it's quite inconsistent. Um, yet again, Australia's top order was exposed by swing from Trent Bolt, just like in Game 1. And we've got some massive questions to ask ourselves here, and the selectors as well. Um, let's start with the obvious one. Aaron Finch again got out for a duck. Is that a surprise? Not really. Um, Aaron Finch, he's under pressure. We all know, you know, in 2022 in one-day cricket, he's averaging 13. Ooh, ouch, that's not good. And here's another alarming stat. He's got five ducks in 2022 in one-day cricket, the most by any Australian in one-day cricket in a calendar year. Ooh, ouch. That's another record that Aaron Finch does not want next to his CV. Um, so he's under pressure, Aaron Finch. Obviously, he's bided his time. So for Aaron Finch, a lot of people have said he should be out of the side, he should be dropped, we should have a new captain. Um, he will play the last game of this series because the reason he will is because Australia have been winning these two games. Now, Australia have won nowhere, have won from nowhere winning these two games, I should say, coming back from very difficult situations. The only reason that Aaron Finch has bought himself more time in this one-day side is because of his captaincy in terms of his tactical nous. In Game 1 and Game 2 especially, his tactical nous uh, reading the game was quite superb, obviously. So he's bought himself more time in this one-day team. But Aaron Finch, I do believe the last game of this series is D-Day. If he doesn't score any significant runs like a half-century or something, you know, then that's it. We we have to ask the questions and make the tough decisions going forward, um, you know, towards that World Cup, obviously. You know, Aaron Finch is, an, is a nice guy, but he's suffering in form, and with his batting, he's sort of bringing the team down in terms of his contribution. First and foremost, he's a batsman. Yes, he is the captain, but you're a batsman. You have to make runs. That's your currency. 
You're not making runs. You should be dropped. Now, if he wasn't captain, he would have been dropped ages, ages ago and we wouldn't have this problem. But since he's been captain, he's captain of this side, I should say, you know, he's not being dropped because of that. So he's under pressure. The other one who is under pressure is Marcus Stornis. Yet again, he failed. He got out for a duck again. And Marcus Stornis, he hasn't really done much in terms of the last few years. Um, he's one who should be really concerned about his spot. With Cameron Green lurking, um, doing well, he could be the number one all-rounder in this side for Australia. And Marcus Stornis could be out of a job. Um... So he really needs to score some runs in the last game. He took a wicket in the in the match, obviously, in the second game, obviously. But really, you know, first and foremost, he's more of a batting all-rounder than a bowler. He can get you the handy wickets, but he needs to score runs. That's his currency. Um, he's not doing that. And Australia's top order have not learned from what happened against Zimbabwe, what happened against New Zealand in the first game, and obviously, it's happened again in the second game of this series against New Zealand. Now, in the in the game against Zimbabwe, the top order were 5 for 72 in game number 3 against Zimbabwe. In game number 1 against New Zealand, there were 5 for 44 inside 12 overs in the run chase. Alex Carey and Cameron Green got them out of a jam. In the second game, this game, there were 5 for 54 uh, inside 18.3 overs. Yet again, the top order failed. Yet again, it had to be Steve Smith or and the tail enders to get them out of out of trouble. The top order, your job as a top order batsman is to score runs and to really learn from your past experiences. They keep making the same mistakes. They know what the New Zealand bowlers are going to do, especially Trent Bolt. When he was bowling to Marnus Labuschagne and Marcus Stornis, he's bowling left arm over the wicket to a right-hander batsman. What do you think he's going to do? He's going to swing the ball back into the right-handed batsman. And he got out Marnus Labuschagne two times now in this series, LBW. Marnus should know, what is he trying to do? How is he trying to get me out? He's trying to get me out, LBW, trying to trap me on the crease. And Marcus Stornis should have thought of that as well. Even though he got bowled in the first game by Matt Henry, the second game he got out LBW to um, Trent Bolt. And both Labuschagne and Stornis used up reviews and that's another thing for Australia. The DRS has been shocking again in this match. Both in the batting innings and also in the bowling innings. It needs to get better. And especially Labuschagne and Stornis reviewed two LBWs that were clearly out. And they just wasted it. What happens if, you know, like Glenn Maxwell got a dodgy decision or something and Australia didn't have any reviews? That's just selfish and that's just not being able to really understand, okay, why is the umpire giving this out? Is it plum as, has he made a genuine mistake? So that's another thing that Australia needs to work on. But besides from that, the batting was indifferent again. And the top order can't rely on other players like Smith in this game, like Kerry and Green in the last game, and like the tail enders like Stark and Zampa and Hazelwood to get them out of a jam. The top order, Warner, Finch, Labuschagne and Stornis, need to contribute. And they haven't. So it's a good opportunity for them to stop the batting collapse and to learn from the last two games, and especially the last game against Zimbabwe, heading into Game 3. That's all I can say. But overall, it was a mixed batting performance from Australia in Game 2 of this ODI series against New Zealand. Let's have a look at the Australian bowlers and their performance in this second ODI against New Zealand. A wicket for Stornis, no wickets for Maxwell, two wickets each for Abbott and Stark, and five wickets for Zampa, and no wickets for Hazelwood. That's how the Australian bowlers went about things against New Zealand in this second ODI in Cairns. What can you say about the Australian bowling performance? It was outstanding, simply outstanding. They were too good for New Zealand, and they bowled them out for 82. And um, they did the basics well. They bowled dot balls, built pressure on the New Zealand batsmen, took wickets at regular intervals, executed their skills and plans with the ball to a tee. And really, they just kept the pressure on New Zealand because New Zealand's batsmen, and we'll talk about this when we talk about New Zealand's batting performance in this match, that they did not put Australia under any sort of pressure with the bat. And Australia were able to bowl what they wanted to bowl to the New Zealand batsmen. And that's what Australia did to the New Zealand batsmen. They bowled their plans, they bowled their deliveries to them that they wanted to bowl, they Built the pressure nicely, Australia. And it's just a quality attack. And they believed, this bowling attack believed that we can defend 
195 runs and win this game and win the series from nowhere. Australia should have lost both games of this series, but New Zealand did not take their opportunities and did not uh, grab the opportunities with both hands and did not win the key moments. Australia did win the key moments, and look what happened. Australia has won the series 2-0. So the bowling was superb. Let's talk about Adam Zampa, the main star. Five wickets for 35 runs. His first ever five-wicket haul in one-day cricket. He was simply outstanding. He bowled very well. Um... Just a great leg spinner. He's really improved over the years. And that delivery uh, to get rid of Kane Williamson, that full toss, obviously he said after the game it was a bit bit of a poor delivery. But he said, at the end of the day, I'll take that. And obviously Kane Williamson just missed a full toss, hit him on the pads. He was out LBW. Should have went over the rope for six. But that just summed up New Zealand's mindset with their batting, really. Um, and that's why they got bowled out for 82. But he was a craft, he's a crafty bowler, Adam Zampa. He uses his variations quite well. I saw that he bowled a lot of wrong ends of late. Um, really challenging the New Zealand batsmen um, and, and getting the wickets and getting rewarded for that, which was pretty good. Um, he was dearly missed in Sri Lanka. He's, Australia's a better bowling side in one-day cricket with Adam Zampa in the side. Um, we saw in Sri Lanka where he missed that series, not by injury, but by family reasons, of course, because he was his wife was expecting uh, to give birth to their first child. That's why he didn't play in the series in Sri Lanka. Um, he was dearly missed by Australia, but by having Adam Zampa on the side, you know he's going to take wickets, he's going to tie down an end, and he gives Aaron Finch another option within the bowling uh, attack. So he bowled really well again, Adam Zampa. He's bowled really well in the Zimbabwean series and also in the, uh, in the uh, New Zealand series in the first two games. And the other one we have to talk about, Sean Abbott. What a spell from Sean Abbott. Two for one. And now Sean Abbott came in for Cameron Green, obviously. Cameron Green didn't quite pull up from the first game, obviously. He was out because of uh, the cramps that he got in the first game. Wasn't really quite 100% for game number two, obviously. So Australia decided not to risk it. There was only a day turnaround between the two games, obviously a short break. So... Uh, Sean Abbott got his opportunity, and he's really improved as a cricketer, Sean Abbott. He did well in the Pakistan series early this year. He was in the squad for Sri Lanka. Unfortunately, he got injured. He broke his finger. So he's been on the sidelines for a long time, but he's got his opportunity in this game because of Cameron Green missing out, and he took it with both hands. Two for one from his five overs. Um, he didn't concede a run until the 29th delivery of his um, spell. Um, he bowled four maidens in a row. Unfortunately, in the fifth over, he conceded his first run, and Aaron Finch thought, well, that's not good enough. I'll take you out of the attack. But at the end of the day, two for one from five overs is a pretty good spell of bowling. And uh, good to see him do well. Um, so, yeah, overall, it was a clinical bowling performance from Australia. Mitchell Stark did his thing, two wickets for 12. Hazelwood was unlucky. Didn't take a wicket, Josh. I thought he was a bit unlucky not to take a wicket, but... He bowled extremely well, as always. And, um, you know, Glenn Maxwell chipped in with a few overs of spin. Did his role as well. Marcus Dornis took a wicket, and he contributed to the bowling effort. So, overall, it was a good, solid bowling performance from Australia. Overall, it was a good comeback from Australia to win the second ODI against New Zealand. Let's have a look at New Zealand's team performance with both bat and ball in this second ODI at Kalele Stadium. We'll start with their batsmen, Guptal 2, Conway 5, Williamson 17, Latham 0, Mitchell 10, Bracewell 12, and Nisham 2. That's how the New Zealand batsmen went about things in this second ODI against Australia. What can you say about New Zealand's batting? It was quite poor. Um, that's pretty much it, really. It was poor. It was an absolutely poor performance. Um, didn't get going at all in the run chase. Chasing 196, you expect New Zealand to chase down the runs. It wasn't to be. They were bowled out for 82, which is their lowest, well, their second lowest ODI score against Australia in their history. Um, they lost wickets at regular intervals throughout the innings um, in this batting collapse. 1 for 2, 2 for 14, uh, 3 for 14, 4 for 33, 5 for 38, 6 for 45, 7 for 54, 8 for 57, 9 for 72, and all out for 82. The partnerships were lacking from New Zealand as well. 
And that's no surprise in a batting collapse. Obviously, the partnerships are quite low. Uh, the partnerships they had in this innings were 2 12, 0 19, 5 7 9, 3 15 10. Um, so that was quite poor uh, with the partnerships here, not backing them up, not really uh, trying to, to make any impact in the run chase whatsoever. Now, just like in game one, their intent with the bat New Zealand was poor again. Too many dot balls, as it was in game one. Same thing happened in game two. Too many dot balls. The lack of intent. Um, they weren't positive enough. They weren't brave. Uh, they didn't put the pressure back on the Australian bowlers. They allowed the Australian bowlers to dictate terms and bowl what they wanted to bowl to the New Zealand batsmen. There was no momentum or fluency whatsoever in the batting innings. Just like in game one, the same thing happened in game two. So pretty much, lots of questions for New Zealand to, to ask themselves, really, to reflect on in this batting performance. And for New Zealand, the biggest thing that's let them down with the bat in this series is their intent. Um, in this batting performance here, they, they dug themselves into a hole that they couldn't get out of. And Australia were good enough to keep the pressure on and keep New Zealand tied down. And they were able to pick up wickets because New Zealand were under pressure. The scoreboard wasn't going anywhere. Australia kept the pressure on and they took wickets and New Zealand weren't able to get themselves out of the hole. In the end, pretty much what they did was bog themselves down. Now, as a batting group, you don't want to get bogged down. You have to look to do the basics well with a bat. That's rotate the strike. Hit and run, get the quick single, drop and run. You know, run hard between the wickets. Did I see that from New Zealand in this match? No, I didn't. I didn't see that at all. And I didn't see them challenge the Australian bowlers and ask the questions in terms of making Aaron Finch and making Mitchell Stark, Josh Hayeswood and Adam Zampa, even Sean Abbott, who bowled really well, they didn't make them... Uh, think about their plans all that often. They didn't make them do something that they wanted, didn't want to do, if that makes sense, um, go away from their set plan. They didn't do that because they didn't put pressure on them. Um, I didn't see any batsmen use their feet to the seamers to put them off their lines and lengths. I think Kane Williamson did the Sean Abbott. He bowled really well in that spell. He got two for none in like four overs, bowling four maidens in a row. And then finally, New Zealand scored a run off them. But all credit... To Sean Abbott, he bowled really well, but really, Sean Abbott's not really that that fast. He's he's a handy bowler, but New Zealand did not put pressure on him and allowed him to bowl what he wanted to bowl to the New Zealand batsman. So that's what I'm talking about here, is that the intent was lacking from New Zealand. There was no intent whatsoever. And this is the thing with New Zealand, is that this team, in their DNA, they're not an aggressive team. They're not a team that... Uh, really intimidates you, if that makes sense. I have a look at this batting order. No one really makes me intimidated. If you're an Australian player, you look at this batting order and you say, right, who makes us worried the most? No one, really. Um, whereas the Australian team, you have a look at their batting order and you say, right, who's going to worry us the most in this match? And New Zealand will definitely be worried about some of the players from Australia, like Warner and Maxwell in particular. Because you know they're aggressive players and they'll take the game on and they'll challenge the bowlers and they'll challenge the opposition captain where he's going to put his field, how he's going to save runs against them. New Zealand didn't do that. And you sort of see it in Kane Williamson's captaincy as well. I've noticed that Kane Williamson's not an aggressive captain. As an example, the first game where, where New Zealand were, had Australia 5 down for 44 in the first game, Right. Trent Bolt was bowling well, but Kane Williamson took him off. And he did not bowl him in that spell. He took him off. He brought the other bowlers on like Ferguson, Satner, Bracewell, Nisham, who all leaked runs. You know, if Trent Bolt continued to bowl in that spell, which he was bowling really well, if he picked up another couple of wickets, Australia would have been 7 for 44 in the run chase. And New Zealand would have won the game. Unfortunately, Kane Williamson let the game drift. And he didn't have that ruthlessness about him. And therefore, Kerry and Green were able to get a partnership. The biggest partnership of the whole series thus far. Over 150. They got Australia home from nowhere. 
And Cameron Green batted superbly with Adam Zampa at the end. Alex Carey did his role. Um, and New Zealand weren't ruthless enough. That's the difference between New Zealand and Australia. Australia are an aggressive team. They'll take it up to the opposition. We've seen that in these two games. Where Australia's up against the wall, in terms of their backs up against the wall, I should say, they always come back and they always fight and scrap. That's what we saw from Australia in game number one in the run chase with Cameron Green and Carey. And we saw that in game number two with the bat, where Mitchell Stark, Josh Hazelwood, Adam Zampa added those partnerships at the end to get Australia to 195. And you could see in their eyes, especially Stark and Hazelwood, when they were batting, they said, we've got enough runs here. We've got the ball in our hands for the second innings. We can cause some damage. And they did. They took early wickets because New Zealand's batsmen did not challenge them, did not put them, put them under pressure, did not make them think about other things in terms of their plans and how they go about it. Didn't do anything, New Zealand. They just didn't show up. It was poor. It was pretty a poor performance, you have to say. And if you're a New Zealand supporter, of course, you're going to be unhappy about this performance because New Zealand can bat better. The one thing that's let them down is that intent. And I go back to the ruthlessness point. Um, the only way that New Zealand are ever going to win in Australia is if they match Australia's intensity in terms of their aggressiveness and being positive when it comes to the bat and the ball. Um, this is the thing with many teams that come to Australia. They get intimidated by Australia. They feel scared. And maybe New Zealand are a bit timid, you know, because they had an opportunity to win the first two games. They didn't take it, New Zealand, because they felt a bit timid. They felt a bit intimidated because that's the aura that this Australian team gives off. Because we all know what's happened before in Australian cricket. There's many great Australian teams under Ponting, Steve War, Mark Taylor, even Alan Border. They were intimidating because they were so good and they played their cricket in an aggressive manner. That's the Australian way. Everyone's taught up. Everyone's pretty much taught in Australia to play the game fair, obviously, within the laws, of course, but play it hard but fair and being aggressive and being positive because negative cricket will never get you anywhere. And that's what New Zealand have done in this series. The only team to match Australia's intensity is India. And I use India as an example because India... They won those two test series in Australia because they matched Australia's intensity. They took the challenge to Australia. They weren't intimidated. They weren't scared. They didn't back away. They said, right, okay, you know, we're here for the battle. You're not going to push us over. We're not going to lose. We're not going to roll over. We saw that. They won the 2018-19 test series under Curley because he was an aggressive player. He's got that aggressive mentality. And Rafi Strastri, you know, has that aggressive mentality as well as Kirch. The series in 2020-21 was a different series to the first series in 2018-19. Different reasons, of course, India were injured and, and all that stuff. But they were still aggressive. If the Australian bowlers bowled a short ball to their batsmen or to their bowlers or tailenders, the Indian bowlers did the same thing. So that's what New Zealand's lacking. That's why they don't have great success in Australia. Because they don't challenge them and they don't stand up for themselves. And, you know really challenge Australia because they don't have that ruthlessness about their cricket that separates them from Australia and that's what we've seen in this series. That's why they collapsed for 82 all out. They didn't put pressure back on the Australian bowlers because they're a bit timid and they didn't want to take the risk and they didn't want to play brave. So that's where it went wrong for New Zealand. What I want to see from New Zealand heading into the third game of the series for them is I want to see them change the mindset. Change, flick the switch, basically, from a negative mindset to a positive mindset. And that is being more proactive when it comes to running between the wickets, run hard, look for the single, get off strike. Don't allow the Australian bowlers to tie you down and bowl six balls at you. That's what you've got to do. Um, and I want to see that from New Zealand. Put pressure back on the Australian bowlers. Make Aaron Finch and the bowlers change their plans and let them do something they don't want to do. So far, New Zealand have not done that. In game three, they got to do that with the bat. If they don't, it could be a same performance as it was in game two, and it could be a 3-0 series defeat if they don't improve things quickly. But New Zealand, they will learn from this, they will reflect from it, 
uh, this performance. It's not ideal to get bowled out for 82. It's quite demoralising when you get bowled out for 100. Um, at least for New Zealand, they can have a bit of solace that they didn't get bowled out for their lowest ever test score. Uh, they didn't quite match that in this one day. So that's a bit of comfort, I suppose. Um, overall, it was a poor performance with the bat from New Zealand, and they will need to improve with the bat if they are going to avoid a 3-0 series defeat. Let's have a look at New Zealand and their bowlers and how they performed in this second ODI against Australia. No wickets for Bracewell and Nisham, a wicket each for Satner and Southie, three wickets for Henry and four wickets for Bolt. That's how the New Zealand bowlers went about things against Australia. Um, just like in game one, New Zealand's bowling was pretty good. Um, New Zealand, just like in game one, um, caused Australia's top order some problems again. Um, in game one, they got them five down for not many um, in the run chase. In game two, Australia batting first. Um, New Zealand got them five down for 54 inside 18.3 overs. Williamson got his tactics right this time. And Trent Bolt, he was the main destroyer again, like in game one. He bowled more overs up front in game two than he did in game one. So Kane Williamson got his tactics right there. Uh, in the end, Trent Bolt got four wickets for 38. Um, New Zealand did well with the ball. Uh, they bowled a lot of dot balls. They built pressure on the Australian batsmen. They took wickets at regular intervals. They executed their plans and skills with the ball. So it was a pretty good bowling performance up front from New Zealand. But all the good work that New Zealand did up front with the ball all came to a bit of an end towards the back end of the Australian innings. And New Zealand didn't quite finish off the job. Now, New Zealand had a great opportunity to bowl Australia out in the low 100s at one stage. When they removed Steve Smith, the 61, they had Australia 8 for 117. But the partnerships between Adam Zampa, Mitchell Stark and Josh Hazelwood for the 9th and 10th wickets cost New Zealand some runs at the end. Those partnerships allowed Australia to get to 195. Now, Australia added 78 runs from 8 for 117 to 195. 78 crucial runs with the last two wickets in terms of their partnerships. So the ninth wicket partnership between Stark and Samper was 31. The tenth wicket partnership between Stark and Hazelwood was 47 unbeaten. And pretty much those two partnerships undid all the good work from New Zealand because New Zealand had a perfect opportunity to finish off the job and bowl Australia out for low 100s. In the end, they conceded 78 runs because of those two wicket partnerships at the end, the ninth and tenth wicket uh, partnerships between Stark and Samper and Stark and Hazelwood. That undid all the great work that New Zealand did up front because they bowled pretty well, New Zealand. Um, and they made it harder for themselves. And uh, New Zealand could have broken the 10th wicket partnership between Stark and Hazelwood a lot earlier. Now, it was during the 47th over, they didn't review an LBW, which was clearly out to Josh Hazelwood when he was on six of um, Michael Bracewell's bowling. Now, Hazelwood was hit on the pads. There, was a, there wasn't really an appeal for LBW, but in the end, Hawkeye said, or ball tracking, uh, said it was um, crashing into leg stump. New Zealand had two reviews. They didn't use one. That would have been the end of the innings. So really, they would have had Australia out cheaply at that stage. Now, Australia were, at the time, Australia were on 9 for 164 when that happened. So... After 47 overs, Australia were 9 for 164. New Zealand could have had Hazelwood out, LBW for 6, but didn't review it. And that could have made a difference for New Zealand. In the end, they leaked runs, and Australia were able to get to 195. Um, so those partnerships gave Australia the momentum, and that showed when they bowled. And for New Zealand, their batsmen didn't show up at all, and obviously got bowled out for 82. And you could see that in the Australian bowlers' eyes, with Stark, Hazelwood, and Sampa that we did get to a total that was enough to defend. We've given ourselves a good chance to win this match, and they bowled really well. And for New Zealand, in the end, those two last-wicket partnerships didn't re really make a big difference um, in terms of how the match eventuated, because New Zealand got bowled out for, 80, uh, sorry, for 82, and they lost by 113 runs, and their batsmen didn't bat well. So didn't really make a difference anyway um, in the end. But... In saying that, New Zealand's bowling was pretty good in this match again. The only thing that's been firing for New Zealand in this series is their bowling. Their bowling's been the biggest positive in this whole series. 
the biggest negative for them is their batting. But their bowling um, is firing all cylinders. Trent Bolt's bowling pretty well. Um, Matt Henry's doing his role. Tim Southby in for his first game. Came in for Lockie Ferguson. Did well. Uh, Jimmy Neesham held up and in pretty well in this game. Mitchell Satner's done well in the series. And he's picked up a few wickets here and there. So they've done pretty well with the bowling in New Zealand. Now, I thought in this game, it was quite weird that they did leave out Lockie Ferguson. The only thing about New Zealand's bowling, the only negative, is they don't have that point point of difference. In terms of that X factor, they don't really have a bowler that can bowl express pace. The only one they do in the side is Lockie Ferguson. Now, he didn't play. Now, there are a number of reasons why he didn't play. Number one, New Zealand thought, you know, seeing that game one and game two had a quick turnaround. Now, you've got to remember that game one and game two only had a one-day break in between. That's why we saw Cameron Green didn't play in game two and Sean Abbott played instead because Cameron Green didn't quite pull up from his cramps and that from game one because there was a short turnaround. Now, maybe New Zealand thought, well, there's a short turnaround. We know Lockie's had some injuries in the past. We just thought it wasn't a risk that we were willing to take. So we decided to rest him and play him in game three. That's one reason. Or the another one is that he probably picked up a niggle during the game, in the first game, he picked up a niggle and, you know, a day break, it wasn't worth the risk. Give him a few extra days off uh, to recover. So those are the two possible reasons that I could think of that he didn't play and didn't take part in the 11. Um, obviously, New Zealand were missing that. They could have finished off the tail quite easily if he was bowling, 150 plus, obviously. Sampa, Stark and Hazelwood would not like to face Lockie Ferguson bowling 150 plus. They would like to face Tim Southie, Matt Henry, uh, Trent Bolt, obviously dangerous as he may be, but they're not express bowlers, so they'll feel comfortable against them. And they certainly did um, when, obviously, those bowlers were bowling to, to them, obviously, and they felt comfortable at that pace. So it's something that New Zealand has to think about going into Game 3. Do we need the extra pace? I think they do for that point of difference to make their bowling even stronger. So... That's how New Zealand went about things with the ball. Obviously, big tick with their bowling, a big cross with their batting. Overall, it was a good bowling performance from New Zealand in Game 2, but unfortunately, their batsmen didn't finish off the job with the bat. Overall, it was a mixed performance from New Zealand in Game 2. Their bowlers were excellent, but their batsmen were poor. Let's preview the third ODI of the series between Australia and New Zealand from Kalele Stadium. Talk about the potential 11s for both teams and who's going to win this third ODI. Let's have a look at both teams' records at uh, Kalele Stadium head-to-head. They've played two matches thus far, and Australia are leading the head-to-head 2-0. Now, let's have a look at Australia's potential 11 for the third ODI against New Zealand from Cairns. I think Australia will make a change to their 11 for the third ODI at Kalele Stadium. I think Cameron Green obviously missing out Um, obviously because of the short turnaround from game one. That's why he didn't play in game two. Um, Obviously, Australia didn't want to take the risk. That's why Sean Abbott got his opportunity. So I think Australia will make one change, and I I know it's a bit stiff on Sean Abbott because he bowled very well, two for one from five overs. Very hard to drop someone after that. But I feel like, you know, Cameron Green should come back to the side. Obviously, he's the incumbent. Obviously, he's the first cab off the rank, so to speak. And Sean Abbott got his opportunity because he missed out Cameron Green because of being rested. So I know it's a bit stiff, but I think Australia may include Cameron Green into the 11 for the next game, and Sean Abbott has to miss out. But another option that Australia could go with is probably drop Marcus Dornis uh, for Cameron Green, and that's where you can keep Sean Abbott in the side. So Australia may do that because Marcus Dornis has been struggling. Maybe Australia go down that route and probably drop Marcus Dornis bringing green for him, and then you keep Abbott in the side, and then everyone's happy. But we shall see what happens, but the potential 11 for the third ODI for Australia could be Warner, Finch, Smith, Labashane, Stornis, Kerry, Green or Abbott, Maxwell, Stark, Sampa and Hazelwood. Let's have a look at New Zealand's potential 11 for the third ODI of this series against Australia. Now, for New Zealand, I think they'll make one change to their 11 for the third ODI at Kalele Stadium. I think Lockie Ferguson, after missing out the second game, may come back. I think he may replace uh, Tim Southie. I think New Zealand, with the bowling in Game 2, has lacked that bit of X factor about their bowling. 
They need Lockie Ferguson for the extra pace to unsettle the Australian batsman. So I think he'll return Lockie Ferguson. Um, I think that could be the only change that they make. Um, I don't see them making changes to their batting because pretty much their batting lineup is pretty much the main batsman that they have in the side in, and also in the squad that they've selected for this series against Australia. So I don't think they'll make any changes to the order in terms of their batting. So I think Lockie Ferguson to come in for Tim Southie to add that bit of extra pace to the attack for New Zealand. So their potential level for the third, for the third ODI, I should say, could be uh, Gupta, Conway, Williamson, Latham, Mitchell, Bracewell, Nisham, Satner, Ferguson, Henry, and Bolt. Now, who's going to win this third ODI at Kalabi Stadium? Well, given how New Zealand have played in the series thus far, you can't go past Australia. Um, Australia should be favourites to win this last game. They've already won the series. They've won two games from nowhere, uh, where people expected them just to roll over and lose. But in the end, you know, what we saw in the first game from Kerry and Green, and what we saw from Australia in terms of Smith, um, Stark, Zampa and Hazelwood with the bat, uh, but also the bowling performance, I think Australia's just too strong. They're just too good. Obviously, New Zealand are outplayed, um, and New Zealand don't have that killer blow and they don't have the right mindset to challenge Australia in this series. So Australia to win the last game, and it's probably going to be a 3-0 series win to Australia. What can we expect from both teams heading into the third ODI at Kalele Stadium? Australia will be delighted with this win. Once again, from nowhere, they managed to find a way to come back and win this second game of the series. All thanks to a brilliant innings from Steve Smith of 61, and late order partnerships of 31 and 47 unbeaten for the 9th and 10th wickets between Adam Zampa, Mitchell Stark and Josh Hazelwood. Gave Australia a total that they could defend. But their bowlers stole the show, putting on a masterclass of bowling as they bowled New Zealand out for just 82. But apart from that, Australia need to address their top order batting and look to stop the collapses heading into Game 3. New Zealand will be disappointed with the way they played in Game 2. They bowled so well to have Australia 8 for 117, but those late-order partnerships from Adam Zampa, Mitchell Stark and Josh Hazelwood ruined the good work and gave Australia a total that they could defend. But they will be disappointed with their batting performance. To be bowled out for just 82 inside 33 overs isn't good enough. New Zealand will need to improve their batting heading into Game 3. If not then it could be a repeat performance, just like in Game 2. What a comeback from Australia. Whenever this team is down and out, they always find a way to come back and win from nowhere. It was an incredible victory by 113 runs to help Australia claim the series, but the Chapel Hadley Trophy as well. They will be determined to make this a 3-0 series win. Well, that's all the time we have for this episode. Be sure to subscribe and click the bell to get the latest episodes of the podcast and like and share our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and on Instagram. Until next time, keep safe and bye for now.